disease, it is not for nothing that it has been used in circus acts and as a dog actor. It has uncommon docility and a fineness of emotions, hence why this guard and attack dog has been trained as a guide dog for the blind. It is of exceptional constitution that allows it to withstand unpleasant experiences without being harmed. It is the reason for which it excels in civil defense operations, especially those that require intervention on rough ground that may injure its legs. It has provided valid proof of being effective as a police dog, message dog, track and guard dog. The Boxer is all this and much more besides, a dog for which character is of equal if not greater importance than physical appearance. If you have children at home, the Boxer will provide a sweet game companion for them and worthy of their utmost trust. In its exuberance and its effusive force, a Boxer of correct character will never exceed if it realizes it is in the company of weaker individuals, whether it be children, the elderly, the sick or other small animals. It is touching to see how a dog, perhaps vivacious and ebullient, shows restraint and keeps its gestures in proportion to the ability of those in its presence to withstand them. It will coax smaller children without ever touching them, running round in circles and frantically wagging the end of its tail, its ears pushed back on the cranium and its sweet look will show its tender friendship. A warning, however, it will not allow anybody to harm its young friends, not even you and if you were to scold them, it would certainly try to good-naturedly come between you and them to prevent your intervention. The Boxer is a gentle giant, aware of its strength and eager to show its affection. It is said to be good-natured, but is not naive. Heaven help whoever dares to threaten its dear ones, whoever tries to harm those he loves or has placed under his protection, whoever shows themselves as enemies of his small friends, because in this case the reaction will always be instantaneous, undaunted, fearsome and very dangerous. The boxer never attacks, but if forced to do so, all the power contained in its athletic fighter body is released in an instant and deadly manner and its powerful bite together with the extraordinary massive impact will get the better of any unwary aggressor in a split second. The real boxer is thus a marvelous concentrate of intelligence, strength, courage, loyalty, goodness and love. Louis Bromfeld, the popular American novelist, lived in the first half of the 20th century, and in his Pleasant Valley he provides a splendid description of the boxer's character, which he knew well, having owned various specimens. Here is what he writes about the entry of the boxer Rex into its house in Paris. It entered the room absolutely sure of itself, took a few steps with dignity, stopped and looked at us. We certainly did not intimidate it, on the contrary. Its personality, its character did not allow us any familiarity. It accepted one of my timid caresses almost like a favor, but having become acquainted, I understood that which it expressed with its look, affection, devotion, loyalty, dignity, and independence. In one of his splendid books on boxers, an internationally renowned judge who has raised the breed for many years, discussing their character, writes, the boxer is first of all personality. This is the boxer a creature that tends to assert itself as a dog and that possesses strong individuality. One should never forget that the ancestors of our canine friend and companion had to confront dangers and perils for centuries and that a strong character has been genetically transmitted from generation to generation, capable of fending for itself and of taking appropriate decisions in situations that arose. Whether dealing with a decision to immediately attack a furious bear or to await the arrival of reinforcements, to stop an unruly bull or to intimidate it only a little, or to intervene with speed and decision in helping its master or to wait for an order from him. In every situation, the boxer's ancestors have always had to act by instinct and for the best, and for them, their life was often at stake. The individuality with which the boxer is endowed makes it a sincere and loyal friend of the master and family, but with man it establishes a relationship of collaboration and of mutual trust, without though ever entering into competition with him. They are intelligent and sensitive dogs and will accept man's superiority only if the latter is aware of how to deserve it. You will never be able to impose your own personality on a boxer through brutal or violent means. He needs to love and respect his master, and only when consideration and trust are exhibited will he show the best of what he is capable. 
The exceptional intelligence with which the boxer is endowed allows it to learn anything quickly and not to forget it afterwards. From the puppy stage, it is very curious about what is happening around it, and it maintains this attention, even if in different ways also as an adult. It is very important characteristic for a guard dog, which the boxer is, since it allows it to always be vigilantly attentive towards whatever is happening. Character traits are as important as the morphological ones, since these are hereditarily transmitted in a percentage ranging from 40 to 60%. Certainly, it is not only the attractive and charming aspect that has brought the boxer worldwide success. Personality made up of sweetness, sociality, constitution, decision, courage, determination in combat and balance have also played their part. Among the many who have become fond of the breed, countless individuals have appreciated its traits of intelligence, sociability and proportionate aggressiveness during World War II. Thus the boxer legend was born. A legend that comes from afar, that has crossed the millennia and the continents, and which must not be lost and let down by a fistful of money. The true boxer is a marvellous dog, full of life, of pride, joy, energy, and why not, love. It learns with ease. It is not for nothing that it's been used in circus acts and as a dog actor. It has uncommon docility and a fineness of emotions. Hence why this guard and attack dog has been trained as a guide dog for the blind. It is of exceptional constitution that allows it to withstand unpleasant experiences without being harmed. It is the reason for which it excels in civil defense operations, especially those that require intervention on rough ground that may injure its legs. It has provided valid proof of being effective as a police dog, message dog, track and guard dog. The boxer is all this and much more besides, a dog for which character is of equal if not greater importance than physical appearance. If you have children at home, the boxer will provide a sweet game companion for them and worthy of their utmost trust. In its exuberance and its effusive force, a boxer of correct character will never exceed if it realizes it is in the company of weaker individuals, whether it be children, the elderly, the sick or other small animals. It is touching to see how a dog, perhaps vivacious and ebullient, shows restraint and keeps its gestures in proportion to the ability of those in its presence to withstand them. It will coax smaller children without ever touching them, running round in circles and frantically wagging the end of its tail. Its ears pushed back on the cranium and its sweet look will show its tender friendship. A warning, however. It will not allow anybody to harm its young friends, not even you. And if you were to scold them, it would certainly try to good-naturedly come between you and them to prevent your intervention. The boxer is a gentle giant, aware of its strength and eager to show its affection. It is said to be good-natured, but is not naive. Heaven help whoever dares to threaten its dear ones, whoever tries to harm those he loves or has placed under his protection, whoever shows themselves as enemies of his small friends, because in this case the reaction will always be instantaneous, undaunted, fearsome and very dangerous. The boxer never attacks, but if forced to do so, all the power contained in its athletic fighter body is released in an instant and deadly manner and its powerful bite together with the extraordinary massive impact will get the better of any unwary aggressor in a split second. The real boxer is thus a marvellous concentrate of intelligence, strength, courage, loyalty, goodness and love. The boxer was born as a work dog. Therefore, to completely and fully develop its personality, it is best to let it carry out any activity that allows it to expend the considerable energies within it. It should be said immediately that its speciality is not, as some may think, as a watchdog, but personal defence. It has been created for this, and whoever thought they could shut it up alone in an enclosure to guard a nondescript shed could be in for a disappointment. The boxer needs contact with man. It is a very sociable animal and protects everything associated with its beloved master, therefore his family members, his house, car, etc. Left alone, it will become melancholy and listless and will certainly not satisfy expectations as a guardian. It has been used in the army, the police corps in different countries, in civil defence, and the feats of boxers raised in Austria by the Mensels, who raised the breed with the best Satan notice, have become legendary and supplied, before moving to Israel, various dogs to the Austrian police. These dogs perform deeds that have remained famous, 
and which is still talked about today. The breed is also endowed with an excellent sense of smell and is shown by the remarkable results that it achieves in times of natural disasters, collaborating with civil defense in the search for buried people. The Breed Club The existing boxer clubs came together some years ago in an organization called Association Technique Internationale du Boxer, ATIBOX, that each year organizes a show with the awarding of a beauty championship in which four ATIBOX championship titles are awarded, one each to a tawny and a striped male and likewise for females. The Atibox Work and Track Championship titles are also awarded. These annual meetings give the opportunity to verify the qualitative level in both morphological and character terms of boxer dogs in various countries of the world. The boxer was born as a work dog. Therefore, to completely and fully develop its personality, it is best to let it carry out any activity that allows it to expend the considerable energies within it. It should be said immediately that its speciality is not, as some may think, as a watchdog, but personal defense. It has been created for this, and whoever thought they could shut it up alone in an enclosure to guard a nondescript shed could be in for a disappointment. The boxer needs contact with man. It is a very sociable animal and protects everything associated with its beloved master, therefore his family members, his house, car, etc. Left alone, it will become melancholy and listless and will certainly not satisfy expectations as a guardian. It has been used in the army, the police corps in different countries, in civil defense, and the feats of boxers raised in Austria by the Mensels, who raised the breed with the best Satan notice, have become legendary and supplied, before moving to Israel, various dogs to the Austrian police. These dogs perform deeds that have remained famous and which are still talked about today. The breed is also endowed with an excellent sense of smell and is shown by the remarkable results that it achieves in times of natural disasters, collaborating with civil defense in the search for buried people. The Breed Club The existing boxer clubs came together some years ago in an organization called Association Technique Internationale du Boxer, ATIBOX, that each year organizes a show with the awarding of a beauty championship in which four ATIBOX championship titles are awarded, one each to a tawny and a striped male and likewise for females. The Atibox Work and Track Championship titles are also awarded. These annual meetings give the opportunity to verify the qualitative level in both morphological and character terms of boxer dogs in various countries of the world. The boxer was born as a work dog. Therefore, to completely and fully develop its personality, it is best to let it carry out any activity that allows it to expend the considerable energies within it. It should be said immediately that its speciality is not, as some may think, as a watchdog, but personal defense. It has been created for this, and whoever thought they could shut it up alone in an enclosure to guard a nondescript shed could be in for a disappointment. The boxer needs contact with man. It is a very sociable animal and protects everything associated with its beloved master, therefore his family members, his house, car, etc. Left alone, it will become melancholy and listless and will certainly not satisfy expectations as a guardian. It has been used in the army, the police corps in different countries, in civil defense, and the feats of boxers raised in Austria by the Mensels, who raised the breed with the best Satan notice, have become legendary and supplied, before moving to Israel, various dogs to the Austrian police. These dogs perform deeds that have remained famous and which are still talked about today. The breed is also endowed with an excellent sense of smell and is shown by the remarkable results that it achieves in times of natural disasters, collaborating with civil defense in the search for buried people. The Breed Club The existing boxer clubs came together some years ago in an organization called Association Technique Internationale du Boxer, ATIBOX, 
that each year organizes a show with the awarding of a beauty championship, in which four Atibox championship titles are awarded, one each to a tawny and a striped male, and likewise for females. The Atibox work and track championship titles are also awarded. These annual meetings give the opportunity to verify the qualitative level in both morphological and character terms of boxer dogs in various countries of the world. When your boxer puppy is brought home for the first time, the best thing to do is to leave it quietly and let it freely explore the new surroundings for a while. It has just left all its certainties behind, its mother, fellow siblings, the people it knew and which it will remember for life. Now it must start a new adventure with you, and at the beginning it is normal if it is a bit confused. Exaggerated attention needs to be avoided, even if there are children present who begin to call after it and want to pick it up. Everything must be done in a relaxing, reassuring and pleasant way. Its kennel, a bowl full of fresh water and some good food recommended to you by your breeder should all be ready. The puppy should be at least two months old and have been vaccinated. After a few minutes, the enthusiasm and optimism of the boxer will prevail and your new friend will soon become familiar with you and the surroundings. After a few days, perhaps even a few hours, it will have fitted in perfectly and be ready to be part of the family. After a few days, it will need to get used to wearing a collar of light and loose-fitting type. Start by putting it on your puppy for a few minutes at a time, to then increase the time it is worn to a few hours. Once it has grown used to it, you can take it off when your dog is inside. Then, after at least one week since the last vaccination, you will be able to, indeed you should, take the boxer to go for a walk, thus allowing it to socialize with other animals and people. You will see how friendly and cordial your dog will be with everybody, and how it will like being stroked and receiving compliments. Indeed, one is unable not to be touched and charmed by the sight of a boxer puppy. During the period of growth, your puppy should be taught to foul where it is allowed, to walk on a lead without straining it or being distracted, to enter crowded places without causing a disturbance, and above all, to live in a social context without problems. In all this, you will be helped by the extraordinary intelligence of the breed, by its natural gift to obey and learn, and by its innate sociability. It will be a pleasure to always have your canine friend in attendance, and its traits enhanced by correct education will fill you with pride. When you have decided to let a boxer puppy enter your house, you have also accepted the honor of looking after a sensitive creature that does not like being alone that needs man's presence and even his physical contact, something which at times it will look for with delicacy and discretion, for example by resting its head on your knee while you are sat down reading, or brushing against one of your legs if you are standing up. As a reward, melancholy, sadness and bad temper will disappear for good, and if you do come up against difficult moments, your boxer will know with its sweetness, intelligence and sensitivity how to reach the bottom of your heart to soften the punishment. When your boxer puppy is brought home for the first time, the best thing to do is to leave it quietly and let it freely explore the new surroundings for a while. It has just left all its certainties behind, its mother, fellow siblings, the people it knew and which it will remember for life. Now it must start a new adventure with you, and at the beginning it is normal if it is a bit confused. Exaggerated attention needs to be avoided, even if there are children present who begin to call after it and want to pick it up. Everything must be done in a relaxing, reassuring and pleasant way. Its kennel, a bowl full of fresh water and some good food recommended to you by your breeder should all be ready. The puppy should be at least two months old and have been vaccinated. After a few minutes, the enthusiasm and optimism of the boxer will prevail and your new friend will soon become familiar with you and the surroundings. After a few days, perhaps even a few hours, it will have fitted in perfectly and be ready to be part of the family. After a few days, it will need to get used to wearing a collar of light and loose-fitting type. Start by putting it on your puppy for a few minutes at a time, to then increase the time it is worn to a few hours. Once it has grown used to it, you can take it off when your dog is inside. Then, after at least one week since the last vaccination, you will be able to, indeed you should, take the boxer to go for a walk, thus allowing it to socialize with other animals and people. 
You will see how friendly and cordial your dog will be with everybody, and how it will like being stroked and receiving compliments. Indeed, one is unable not to be touched and charmed by the sight of a boxer puppy. During the period of growth, your puppy should be taught to foul where it is allowed, to walk on a lead without straining it or being distracted, to enter crowded places without causing a disturbance, and above all, to live in a social context without problems. In all this, you will be helped by the extraordinary intelligence of the breed, by its natural gift to obey and learn, and by its innate sociability. It will be a pleasure to always have your canine friend in attendance, and its traits enhanced by correct education will fill you with pride. When you have decided to let a boxer puppy enter your house, you have also accepted the honour of looking after a sensitive creature that does not like being alone, that needs man's presence and even his physical contact, something which at times it will look for with delicacy and discretion, for example by resting its head on your knee while you are sat down reading, or brushing against one of your legs if you are standing up. As a reward, melancholy, sadness and bad temper will disappear for good, and if you do come up against difficult moments, your boxer will know with its sweetness, intelligence and sensitivity how to reach the bottom of your heart to soften the punishment. When your boxer puppy is brought home for the first time, the best thing to do is to leave it quietly and let it freely explore the new surroundings for a while. It has just left all its certainties behind, its mother, fellow siblings, the people it knew and which it will remember for life. Now it must start a new adventure with you, and at the beginning it is normal if it is a bit confused. Exaggerated attention needs to be avoided, even if there are children present who begin to call after it and want to pick it up. Everything must be done in a relaxing, reassuring and pleasant way. Its kennel, a bowl full of fresh water and some good food recommended to you by your breeder should all be ready. The puppy should be at least two months old and have been vaccinated. After a few minutes the enthusiasm and optimism of the boxer will prevail and your new friend will soon become familiar with you and the surroundings. After a few days, perhaps even a few hours, it will have fitted in perfectly and be ready to be part of the family. After a few days it will need to get used to wearing a collar of light and loose fitting type. Start by putting it on your puppy for a few minutes at a time, to then increase the time it is worn to a few hours. Once it has grown used to it, you can take it off when your dog is inside. Then, after at least one week since the last vaccination, you will be able to, indeed you should, take the boxer to go for a walk, thus allowing it to socialise with other animals and people. You will see how friendly and cordial your dog will be with everybody, and how it will like being stroked and receiving compliments. Indeed, one is unable not to be touched and charmed by the sight of a boxer puppy. During the period of growth, your puppy should be taught to foul where it is allowed, to walk on a lead without straining it or being distracted, to enter crowded places without causing a disturbance, and above all, to live in a social context without problems. In all this, you will be helped by the extraordinary intelligence of the breed, by its natural gift to obey and learn, and by its innate sociability. It will be a pleasure to always have your canine friend in attendance, and its traits enhanced by correct education will fill you with pride. When you have decided to let a boxer puppy enter your house, you have also accepted the honour of looking after a sensitive creature that does not like being alone, that needs man's presence and even his physical contact, something which at times it will look for with delicacy and discretion, for example by resting its head on your knee while you are sat down reading, or brushing against one of your legs if you are standing up. As a reward, melancholy, sadness and bad temper will disappear for good, and if you do come up against difficult moments, your boxer will know with its sweetness, intelligence and sensitivity how to reach the bottom of your heart to soften the punishment. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development, so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything, and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake, since what may be digestible to us, and a source of nourishing substances, often cannot be digested by dogs, or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. 
It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms, or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk, and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours. Then the food passes into the intestine, where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted, and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet, which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treaties, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes, which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders, depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch, which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fiber, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines, where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A buildup of vitamins can be harmful, and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements, and if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Deficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper, and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. 
Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will, however, be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty, taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water. Fresh and plentiful, but must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to eighteen months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours, then the food passes into the intestine where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, 
it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require specific treaties, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch, which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fiber, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A build-up of vitamins can be harmful and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements and, if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Deficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will however be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. 
Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water, fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to eighteen months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development, so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything, and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake, since what may be digestible to us, and a source of nourishing substances, often cannot be digested by dogs, or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms, or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk, and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours, then the food passes into the intestine where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted, and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet, which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require specific treaties, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet. 
even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fiber, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A build-up of vitamins can be harmful and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements and, if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Efficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies, also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will, however, be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty, taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water, fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, 
puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to eighteen months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live. The arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari. They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, ulcerstenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognizable by their reddish color, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialized grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalize about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. 
Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never